We don't have the benefit of pixie dust, so we have to board a plane to get to Disney World. Today, we're talking about our attempts to have a smooth and comfortable flight. Welcome to Always Planning Disney, where planning is half the fun. I'm Cheryl. And I'm Melissa. And on this channel, we talk through all of the details that go into making our vacations magical. So I guess since we're talking about flying, is driving even a possibility for you? Yeah. Okay. So I'm sure everyone can guess from our accents on this channel that we're both located in the Midwest. I live near the Twin Cities in Minnesota, and it's absolutely possible to drive to Disney from the Twin Cities. And we had one branch of my extended family. They would drive every single year. They would like leave our Christmas gathering and directly go to Disney World and they they had the benefit of some truck drivers in the family so they would literally drive around the clock until they got there especially when their kids were old enough that they could then start taking driving shifts but it's it's a long drive from here to Disney and I personally hate driving on the freeway I hate driving in places that I'm not familiar with so I would only consider driving from Minnesota if we went with my folks and we rented like one large vehicle for our whole family, which then I'm not sure, like it would probably still be less than five plane tickets, but it would cut into some of the savings that you have with driving over flying. But I think what puts me over the edge is I tend to get car sick when driving or when, when riding in a car, but I don't have any trouble with motion sickness when flying. So that plus getting there faster, we're probably going to keep flying from here. I think it's the same for us. People from Michigan, where I live, drive to Florida all the time. We have a straight shot on a single freeway from Detroit all the way through Florida, but it is about 18 hours without stops. And I'm the driver for the family. So there is no shift taking. And that means we would have to divide that trip into two days. That's two full travel days on either end of a vacation. Mm-hmm. Four days, those are just four wasted days. So we yeah. will always fly just for the speed. If I were going to stay for a really long time, I would completely drive because the ratio of travel days to vacation would be balanced a little bit better. But I do not have a life where I can just go to Florida for a month. So It's going to be be flying for us. Now, my real dream is that we would have high speed rail in this country. And even if it took substantially longer than flying, and even if it cost more, I think we would still travel that way because um, the ease of train trips, the ones we have taken around the Midwest completely beats flying any day. But once again, not our reality. So we will continue to fly. Yes, airplanes for us. (laughs) So do you have any like magic anything when it comes to booking your flights? Because this is still, I guess, an area where I feel a lot less confident in planning my trip. How's it go for you? I don't know if I have much confidence either. The one thing that I always look for is a direct flight because it's easier, especially with kids not having to change planes at any time. But also our airport of Detroit Metro Airport to Orlando they are hubs for several carriers and the direct flights are constant. Like it's very easy to find a flight between Detroit and Orlando and they always tend to be direct. So I I aim for that, but I cannot figure out the best time to book. I've heard eight weeks ahead, but I don't know if there's any truth to that. I don't know either. And I guess eight weeks feels so close to the trip itself that that just makes me nervous, especially I mean, we're talking about renting DVC points again. So that's 11 months out that we're booking our hotel, yet we don't have a way to get there yet. I don't know. That just makes me really uncomfortable. So we don't follow any like, I don't know, magic numbers for when to book. We just kind of keep an eye on them and jump on flights when it seems like it's a good price. We have tried to like fly on certain days that are supposed to be a little less expensive and that worked out for us last time, but I just, I don't know how much truth there is to that stuff either. And for our last trip, we spend a lot more on flights than we normally do. And I didn't love that, but it was our son's first flight. 
So we had no idea how it was going to go for him. And that was scary. And so we wanted it to be a direct flight, even though normally we've been comfortable, you know, in the past when it's just been adults traveling, we're comfortable having a layover that doesn't bother us too much. But we didn't want to do that in case like takeoff and landing were really scary for him or something like that. And we also wanted to try and have it be during his nap time if we could manage it in the hopes that he would sleep during the flight. So next trip, I think we'll be a little bit more relaxed when it comes to the timing of our flight. We might consider a layover. We won't worry so much about time of day, but I think the, the trade-off will be we'll want to make sure that if we do have a layover or if we are getting in at not such a great time, we'll want to make sure that there's a pretty significant cost savings. We aren't going to be doing that for like just a couple bucks here and there. I'll also say when it comes to booking flights, I'm really interested in getting into the points and miles game because I don't want to pay for flights anymore. I want those to be free. <laughs> I want to like game some cards, but I haven't gotten into that yet. So that's like one of my goals for the future is it's hard. It's hard in many ways to save money on a Disney vacation, but flights are one way that you can save money. And I'd like to make that happen for us. So I feel better that I also have not gotten into the points game because after the last trip, I said the same thing. Flights were so expensive in early 2020. And usually flying to Orlando is, is pretty cheap in terms of the places you can fly to around the country that tends to be relatively affordable. And it was not affordable at all in 2020. Um, I Part of me looking back now, with the benefit of hindsight, wonders if the airlines sort of knew that COVID was going to take us all down Ooh. and just made things more expensive while they still could. It's a conspiracy theory here on APD, Melissa. <laughs> you <laughs> hear, heard it here first. <laughs> yep. But cost aside, we were still able to get a flight last year that was within my like comfort range of spending. We did have to switch from our favorite Delta to Spirit, which was difficult for my children who have become accustomed to not only flying Delta, but getting that like slight upgrade to be closer to the front with the larger rows. And we were just straight up regular Spirit smack middle of the plane. And that was a big change. For them but it's a, it's like a two hour two and a half hour flight like you can deal with it you can deal with it it's not that bad I think we actually did fly Delta I would have to go back and look but it was one of those like main airlines and we aren't normally Delta people so it felt pretty fancy to have TVs in our seats <laughs> yeah oh my kids are huge fans of those screens and it definitely helps a lot but the screens become a part of our boarding ritual when we get on the plane. I mean, um, everything. Yeah. One, on one of our last videos, I mentioned I have this three-part ritual for even getting on the plane. I, so airplane, it is an enclosed space, lots of people, lots of germs. I know that that plane lands, they empty the trash, maybe vacuum the center aisle. There's a lot going on in those seats and I do not want us to get sick on our way to anywhere, but especially not on our way to a Disney vacation. And I am particularly worried about catching any sort of stomach virus because those are disgusting. They take you down fast and I dehydrate really quickly. And this happened after our trip to Disney. I had to be in the hospital getting rehydrated with IV fluids for eight hours. I'm not doing that when I'm at Disney. So when I walk on that, on that plane, I start off with wet ones. I get the ones that are both antiviral and antibacterial or any sort of hydrogen peroxide wipe because it takes hydrogen peroxide or bleach or an antiviral wipe to even touch a norovirus. So I start with that, anything we might touch. So it's the screens, it's the armrests, it's the buckle, get that all wiped down. After that, I move on to the Lysol. Lysol makes a travel size spray that you can get through airport security. So everything gets sprayed from like our seats to the screens again. And after it's all soaked, I finish with an essential oil spray um, that I make myself. It is lavender and peppermint. And that just goes on the seat like near our heads to sort of, I guess, cancel out the smell of all the Lysol I've sprayed everywhere. And I do this every time we get on a plane and I've never had anybody confront me, the woman who is spraying things all over her section of the cabin. So 
it hasn't been a problem for us. Okay, so let me ask you a logistical question. Um, right, so you you got it through airport security. I understand that because if you have a small enough container and I'll follow all the rules, but like, it takes a little while to do all of this, right? Where where is everyone? Like, are they standing in the aisle? Are they across on the other side of the aisle waiting for you so that their seats have dried off and they can sit down? How does this work? <laughs> This is a good question. And this really only works because with four people traveling, first of all, Ray's opposite side of aisle and I probably toss cleaning supplies to him. I don't know, he's on his own. But over where I am with the kids, we can all fit in a row while I clean. So people can continue to board. We aren't taking up any space, holding up the line. We are small enough that we fit. So it works. I think if you were, you know, all full-sized humans, that would be a bit more difficult. Uh, or if you didn't have the entire row, you probably couldn't scrub it all down. Unless somebody might appreciate it. I would like it if my person sitting next to me was like, oh, would you like me to clean your seat? <laughs> yes. Okay, right, that's very helpful. Thank you. And we'll put um, products down below again, because I'm going to need links. And I imagine other people are going to need links. <laughs> so for us, like, I don't know, I'm used to a different kind of boarding process. I do not have your routine. I will be doing that next time. But we have, we're used to a different kind of boarding process, because we have for a long time been Southwest people. And if you're not familiar with Southwest flying, it's like booking your ADR or your fast pass, rest in peace or whatever, where you're like 24 hours out from your flight, you gotta be on it and press the button at exactly the right time so that you can then get the A boarding group instead of the B or the C boarding group so that then you can have your best seats. So it's like a whole different kind of boarding. We didn't do that this time. We had assigned seats. So it was nice not to have that extra like stressor going into what was a, a crazy first Disney trip with our kid and first flight with our kid. So when we were actually boarding our flight, we knew where we were sitting and we kind of split up responsibility where my husband had all of our stuff and it was a lot of stuff and I had our child. <laughs> and so he, like we had to gate check our stroller because we had used that to get around the airport. And then we had brought a car seat onto the plane for our son to sit in. And so that's, I mean, I'm glad that I wasn't the one trying to get a car seat down the center aisle of an airplane, but he managed to do it and he installed it and it was all fine. So it wasn't a big deal. And I was glad that we brought the car seat along both for safety and also because I think he was probably much more comfortable in his normal car seat than he would have been in just the, the airplane seat. In the past, when we have had the opportunity to do like the boarding group where you then just get on in your boarding group and grab an open seat, we've tried to get my husband that extra legroom spot in the emergency row, which is like super awesome for him as a six foot four human being who like does not fit into normal seats. But that's just not an option anymore. You have to be above a certain age. You can't be a minor and sit in those rows because you have to be prepared to help people in an emergency. So that's not an option. He had to cram in. But again, it's just, it's not that long of a flight. So he can deal. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Which is sort of the same philosophy that I use. Ray is six foot two. And I, you just, you're going to fit across from wherever the rest of us are. I will say that sharing a row with two kids is so spacious. I'm, I'm compact to begin with. I'm only five feet tall. So, I mean, I fit in an airplane, no problem, but having children in the row next to you is incredibly comfortable. Um, <laughs> there's so much space, even without upgrading. <laughs> you got your own first class upgrade. Yes. <laughs> it probably costs more than a first class seat having to buy four tickets, but. All right. So we, we've gotten on board our flights. I was really nervous last flight, not so much for myself, but for Bud, because it was his very first flight. And I'm like, how is this going to go? How is this going to go? Is this going to be terrible? He wasn't nervous at all about it. Um, I think we had like read some stories and probably watched some shows and things, but like, it's not like we did a ton of preparation or anything. It was just like, we're going on a flight to Disney World and he wasn't nervous at all. A specific 
thing that I was worried about on this flight was having to bring him to the bathroom on the plane because I try not to use those bathrooms personally. <laughs> like I don't like being in a bathroom on any sort of moving vehicle. <laughs> so <laughs> I try not to use those. But he was, you know, two on the way down there, three on the way back. He had been potty trained for over a year at that point, but he still had like a little bladder, right? And I was pretty sure that he was going to need to use that bathroom. And I was going to have to figure out how to fit both of us and hold him over it. And it was going to be a whole thing. He didn't wind up having to use it. So I worried for nothing. It wound up being completely unnecessary. So it was all... As usual, it was all me worrying and no actual need for concern. Yeah. I didn't prepare. I have never prepared my kids for, for a flight, I don't think, at all. And honestly, I don't know if Jack even realizes what flying is or that you're up and like, obviously he must feel it, but I don't know. There's no anxiety or nerves that have clicked for him yet which is nice because he tends to be far more anxious he gets that from me and I know one day that might switch and we'll have to spend more time preparing and talking about it my oldest is starting to feel some anxiety with flying and I don't know how to manage that or, or help her at all so I am open for any sort of tips because although I have a little bit of flying nerves I realized not as much as other people out there before this last trip I was feeling anxiety in the weeks leading up to it and I decided to of course search randomly on the internet for people in a similar position to see what they had done and what they're thinking and feeling and in reading some of the narratives of other people I realized okay, I guess I'm not that nervous about flying because that experience is not mine at all. I've always reminded myself that you're not supposed to be in the air. So you should be a little bit nervous about that. But in this grand search, I encountered a YouTube channel called Fly with Stella. She had a video about, you know, managing anxiety surrounding flying. And she herself is a flight attendant. And I got hooked on her videos, just her day to day, the work, the trips, the stuff. She is so charming and fun. It's a great channel to watch. So I start, I watch that now before a flight just to get in the mood, it sort of hypes me up and it's child friendly enough that maybe I could show that to, to Maddie to get her in the mood for flying. So one of the things with my nerves about flying, I love takeoff and, and landing because they're exciting. And I like seeing the landscape, you know, disappear and come back into focus. But I tend to get really sort of a nervous energy slash boredom once I'm up in the air, because I always need something to do. And I, I joke that a perfect flight for me would be if they had like human hamster wheels or treadmills and I could just walk or jog the entire trip I would be fine and even though it's just a two and a half hour flight to get to Disney that's a long time and I am always worried about keeping my children entertained so what did you do on your last trip we were so worried about this. I didn't want to be the parent who had a screaming child on the flight because that's no fun for anybody. That's no fun for the child or the parents or anyone else that is on that airplane. So I was really worried about this. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing it turns out that we did was we downloaded our son's favorite Disney Junior shows onto the iPad because now you can download from, I think most of those streaming services, you can download a few episodes. And he literally sat and watched cartoons the entire flight, both flights. We don't normally let him watch that much TV straight at home. So the fact that we're like, here you go, have an iPad, watch as much as you want. Uh, he, he went for that hard. <laughs> so he didn't wind up taking a nap like I was hoping he would. And then that made me concerned for the entire rest of the day that he hadn't napped. And normally he was terrible if he didn't nap. But he also was like the best behaved child on both of those flights. He didn't scream. He hardly complained. In my experience, a flight to Orlando is 50% children. So I tell myself if mine is crying or freaking out, 
the other people will understand. Mm -hmm. But luckily I had a similar experience to you. Every time I have flown my kids to Disney, they have been wonderful travelers. However, I knew going in, we weren't going to have our amazing Delta screens to play with. So I also had to download content, not only for them, but for myself. I downloaded a bunch of episodes of Marvelous Mrs. Maisel and it was great. I had my drink and I watched TV and that's, that's it. We just relied on screens. We didn't bring any other extra form of entertainment along. It's just sort of sit down, enjoy the screen. My kids were fine with that. But again, it's a short enough trip that a few episodes or a movie, including a snack break, um, maybe the distraction of takeoff and landing, perhaps one bathroom. I mean, that's the whole flight. So yeah. it's, it's pretty easy to stay entertained when it's that short. Yeah, I think we were almost disappointed because we thought that like, you know, we could look out the window at takeoff and landing and he would think that that was really cool. He didn't care. He just wanted to keep watching on his iPad. (laughs) So it wound up being like kind of a boring flight for the adults along because like we thought we were like ready to entertain him, right? My husband and I, my folks were there just across the aisle. They were ready to jump in if needed. And he just didn't need any of us. So I was like, okay, I guess I'll watch a movie on my Delta screen. And I had brought some knitting along. I love to knit on planes. So yeah, it was it was a weird experience, but it gives me a lot of hope that we can do more travel coming up and he'll be all right on our flights. Yeah. The only bump I have with my kids in flying is there is a little bit of physical discomfort for them. My oldest gets motion sickness sometimes. We um, have found some forms of ginger candy that she likes that kind of help. And we also use the pressure point wristbands. I will say that flying is not as bad for her as driving, like in your experience, but it can a little bit, it can get to her. And because the effects last for a few hours after the motion has finished, we try to avoid it because it's just going to ruin part of her day. She also has a lot of ear pain and I think Jack might too, but it's hard to tell because his complaints about things sometimes don't have the most accurate description. We try chewing gum. I don't know if it works that well. There's some suffering. I don't know what else to do. Our ears hurt. Yeah, we were anticipating some issues with ear pressure because, I mean, just in general, like it's air travel, you're going to have your ears pop. But our son had had a lot of ear infections when he was a baby. And so I didn't know like if that would make him more sensitive or I don't know, maybe that's maybe that's completely unrelated. I'm not sure. But we were concerned about it. So we just fed him a steady stream of M&Ms and other snacks, but mostly M&Ms during takeoff and landing. He didn't complain once. He just kept holding out his hand for more M&Ms. So he was was the happiest little traveler. (laughs) Well, I mean, unlimited M&Ms and unlimited screen time. Like, what could be better than that? (laughs) Thanks so much for tuning in. Let us know in the comments how you have successful flights when traveling to Disney. And remember to like and subscribe to plan along with us.